Uh, today's a review day, catch-up day. Um, not, not catch-up like you put on French fries, but sort of that catch-up re- review of what we've been doing. Um, we've been studying from the book of Mark, and we've called this study, Love Lives Here. And I, I really believe love lives here. I, I feel it. I see it. Uh, I saw it yesterday in the, in the, the loss of a spouse. Um, but but I, 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 we call it love lives here because I want us to challenge us by that. Because we're called to love God with everything we've got. And we're called to love the things that God loves. Love lives here. Um, St. Saint, Saint Peter said these words. And maybe this is a mantra behind all of this. Above all else, above all else, love one another deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of our stuff, of our sins. Um, Here's the highlights so far. And if you've got a Bible handy, we've got uh, some in the pews. Or if you've got a Bible app on your phone, um, please turn to the Gospel of Mark. We're still in Mark chapter 1. We've been fussing with this the last four weeks. We're going to fuss with it some more. But we're in Mark chapter 1. Just review. Mark 1.1. First line out of the shoot. The storyteller. The narrator. Mark shares this with us. He tells us, this is the beginning of the good news. This is the beginning of the gospel. This is the beginning of the story of the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Son of God. Then John the Baptist, I'm going to go fast. John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus just as it had been foretold in the Old Testament from the prophet Isaiah. John comes on the scene. He starts preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And that seems critical in this prep work that John's doing. John's a big deal apparently too. People flock to John confessing their sins. They are baptized in the River Jordan. Again, John's there to prepare the way to get folks ready for Jesus. John tells everybody who will listen, after me comes someone that I'm not even worthy to untie their sandals or their shoes. I baptize you with water. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And then Jesus shows up one day and he's baptized by John, full dunk, full immersion in the Jordan River. And as Jesus is coming up out of the waters, there's this heavenly event that happens. The heavens are torn. They're ripped open. It's not just the parting of the clouds. It's violent. Um, And the Holy Spirit, Scripture says, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus like a dove. And then the Holy Spirit fills Jesus. Um, Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there's this powerful part, the voice from heaven, the voice from God the Father. You are my son. With you, I love. You're my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The blessing from God the Father. Words of affirmation and encouragement right before Jesus jumps into his public ministry. We didn't touch on this, but there was then the testing of Jesus in the desert, in the wilderness, tested by Satan for 40 days, made stronger, I believe, by this time in the desert. And Matthew and Luke's gospel share with us, Jesus fasted those 40 days to help him get ready, fasted 40 days to help him focus. Personally, I'm more of a four-hour fast guy. After that, I get cranky. Um, That Snickers commercial, I'm all over it. Um, But then Jesus jumps into his work. First red words in my gospel, in Mark's gospel, first words of Jesus. The time has come. The time has come. It's time. Time, Time's up. Time has come. The kingdom of God, the the kingdom of God is at hand. The king is at hand. Repent. Turn back to me. Believe in the good news. Believe in the gospel. Just, just a real quick reflection on the Jewish perspective. They were always looking back, remembering their stories. Remember when we were slaves. Remember when we crossed the Red Sea. Remember the covenant. covenant. Remember the manna, manna for the day. Remember when we strayed and God still loved us. Remember, remember, remember. Jewish folks of Jesus' day always looking backwards, walking backwards, if you will, into the future. Um, and Jesus is now saying, it's time. Time has come. Repent, turn around, metanoia, face the future, head on. We'll do it together. The time has come. St. Paul says, but one thing I do, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, we press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and facing forward, metanoia, turning forward. And then Jesus in the story calls Peter and Aunt Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and James, and John, two sets of brothers, fishermen, to follow him. Come follow me. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Not knowing exactly what that is, they do. And the boys and Jesus go to church. And this is where we were last Sunday. They go to synagogue on the Sabbath, and there Jesus begins to teach with authority. With Shmika, the Jews would say. And the folks are amazed. They've never heard anything like this. And then the demon-possessed man, this hurting man, he cries out of his pain, out of his suffering. 
demon-possessed man says, what do you want with us? What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Questions the man in his pain asks. Questions you and I may ask when we're struggling or in pain. What do you want with us? Have you come to destroy us? Have you come to make us miserable? What life is throwing at me right now, I feel like I'm losing. I feel like there's a part of me that's dying. And then Jesus speaks to the demon, the impure spirit, be quiet, come out of him. And Jesus speaks directly to the demon, the thing that possesses the man. And the demon, the impure spirit, listens, but not without struggle. The demon shakes the man violently and then leaves him with a shriek. And all the folks in the pews that day are saying, wow, wow, wow. A new teaching and with authority with Shemekah. Look at that. Even the demons listen, to, listen and obey. And news, the good news, the gospel, the story of Jesus spreads quickly all over Galilee. Okay? That's four weeks worth of stuff. You're all caught up. Love lives here. We're all still learning what that means. Our goal as followers of Jesus is to look and live and love more and more like Jesus. Philippians 1.6 being confident in this, that God who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We're all a work in process. None of us is there. God's not done with us. God's working to change us, change us to be more and more like his son, Jesus. And as we've been fussing with Mark's gospel, especially these past couple of weeks, I've been trying to see, trying to understand what Jesus is teaching his first disciples. What's he teaching or showing Simon and Andrew and James and John what are their takeaways each day? What mental notes are they taking as they begin this journey, as they begin following Jesus? What are they learning? And then in some rubber hits the road ways, what does God want us to learn too? What are, what are our takeaways? And if I could, I'd have you turn just to Mark, um, Mark chapter 1, verse 29. That's where we'll jump into the story today. And this is part one of the story. We'll break it into two parts. This is the same day as Jesus was in the synagogue teaching with authority and driving out the demons. Same day. This is that afternoon. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. Simon to Jesus, Mom's, Mom's sick. My mom-in-law, my, my wife's mom is sick. Can you help? So Jesus went to her took her by the hand and helped her up. Jesus healed her. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. First words of this part of the story, as soon, soon as. Uh, again and again in Mark's gospel, he uses those same words. Uthos is the Greek word. Um, there's a sense of urgency. Mark wants us to remember that there's, a, there's, there's a timeline to this. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And then Jesus moves quickly from healing folks at church to healing folks at Simon and Andrew's home. These two worlds, our church world and then our everything else world. And I know I struggle with this at times. There's my church life, our church life, and then there's all the other stuff. Um, my other lives, my home life, my work life, all the other stuff, hobbies, families. Jesus connects the worlds here. Reminds us it's all church. And then Jesus makes it personal. With his first followers, this hits close to home. Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law. And some of us know this, happy wife, happy life. Um, repeat it after me, happy wife, happy life. Um, you newlyweds, you guys should take note. Um, and we learn in this part of the story, Simon Peter is married. If any of you have followed the series called The Chosen, um, I love how this scene is depicted in The Chosen. It's a movie series about the followers of Jesus. Um, season one, episode eight, The Chosen takes this gospel story and uses some poetic license to show another side, but I think it's true. From the movie, Jesus comes to Simon and Andrew's home, and he meets Simon's wife, Eden, and Jesus blesses Eden. Jesus tells Eden that sometimes his journey with him, Simon and Andrew's journey with him, it's not going to be easy. And Eden says, and I love this line, it's not our people's way. Um, and then Jesus blesses and encourages Eden for the role she has. Keeping the home going, the family going, she's important too. And Jesus says to her, I see you. I see you. Powerful words to Eden. Powerful words to all of us. I see you. I see you. I recognize you. 
I care is what Jesus says. And then Jesus goes in and heals Eden's mom. First healing, it's the first healing in Mark's gospel, first physical healing from being sick, mom-in-law burning up with fever, to being healed. And then she begins waiting on them, serving them. The word in the original Greek is where we get our word deacon, the word used to describe uh, the work of church leaders and pastors, to minister or to serve. The mother-in-law's response to her healing, she gets up and serves. Serves the disciples, serves Jesus. That's part one of the story. Here's part two. Quick sidebar. Again, all of today's story, again, it's a continuation of last week's story. It happens all on the same day. They do church. Jesus teaches with authority with Shemekah. The demon-possessed man cries out. Jesus heals the man, drives the demon out. Work spreads fast about Jesus. There's something very different about this guy, this rabbi, this Jesus, this teacher. Picking it up today, they come to Simon and Andrew's home. Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law. First the healing in the synagogue, now this healing in the home. It's been a busy day so far. And now here's how the day, how the evening finishes. Part two of the story, this is God's word. That evening after sunset, the end of the Sabbath day was, the Sabbath went from Friday sundown to, to Saturday sundown. That evening after sunset, the people brought Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. They brought all the sick and demon-possessed. And the whole town, everybody, the whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. They would have come earlier, but Jesus, but Jewish custom prohibited work of any kind, even good work, even healing work. You had to wait until sundown, the end of the Sabbath. This healing stuff, this healing stuff, this healing on the Sabbath by Jesus would eventually become a thorn in the teachers of the law's side. Um, and we'll fuss with that in the weeks to come as we follow Mark's gospel. Back to the text. These were good, God-fearing Jewish folks. They obeyed the law and they waited. But once that sun went down, everybody was, who was sick, or if you had a demon or two, you brought them to Jesus that evening. Folks helping folks. Good church, church. This all happened in the time frame of just one day. From the time Jesus healed the guy possessed with the demon at church to now, to sunset, and word had spread about Jesus. And we can just guess how that happens. Everyone at church that day, folks on the way home from synagogue, everyone they met along the way, everyone they met on the way home, they shared the story and his teaching, this Jesus and his teaching and his healing. And then they told somebody. And then they told somebody. Good news Good news like that spreads, the gospel like that spreads, especially if you're sick, and maybe even more so if you have a loved one who is sick. One beggar, one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. Um, this grief share ministry that I love and support, it is one beggar telling another beggar where to find food, where to find Neosporin for your soul. And I love what these folks do here. Um, one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. In this case, one person telling another person where to find Jesus. And in finding Jesus, there seems to be healing and peace. Redemption, rescue. Rescue from disease and illness. Rescue from anxiety and depression. Rescue from struggle and suffering and pain and fear and guilt and loss and sadness and anger. You name it. New life, Jesus says. Joy and hope and faith. This is the gospel this is the good news. And I just want to park on that word gospel just for a bit. Gospel, many of us know, it literally means good news or good story. And for some of us, when we think of the gospel, we think of the story of Jesus. Mark's gospel, again, it starts out with those words. This is the beginning of the good news. This is the beginning of the gospel. This is the beginning of the story of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God. Emmanuel, God with us. This is information the storyteller knows, and he lets us in on it. Mark gives us inside information. Nobody else in the story, nobody else in this part of the story seems to know who Jesus is. They know he's charismatic. They know he can heal folks. People seem to want to follow him. And they know he's different. He teaches with authority with Shemekah. Only two folks really know who this person is. John the Baptist, he's been preparing the way. But then for some wacky reason... The impure spirits or the demons seem to know who Jesus is. 
What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I don't want to land on that. We'll fuss with that some next week. But this word gospel, we throw it around like everyone knows the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. That's, the, that's true for, uh, for us who try to follow Jesus. But the gospel writers, back in the day, they borrowed this word gospel from the Roman Empire. Pre-Jesus, the gospel of their day was the Roman world. It was Caesar. The gospel for them was Caesar. And I borrowed this teaching from Steve Cuss, a gifted writer and speaker and pastor I follow. What the word meant in Jesus' day, the gospel meant three things. If you were following the gospel of the day, the gospel of the Roman Empire, that's where this story takes place. Israel is part of the Roman Empire. There were three things, three Ps. There was a path, there was a promise, and there was a price. You wanted to follow the gospel of the Roman Empire, there were the three Ps. There was a path, there was a promise, and there was a price. The path in the Roman Empire, you need to obey us. If you obey the Roman conqueror's ways, if you defer to the Roman emperor, you'll be okay. That's the path. You need to acknowledge the sovereignty of the ruling empire, the path. Just obey the rules, you'll be okay. If you do what we tell you, here's the promise. We'll protect you. This is the promise. This is the Pax Romana, the, the Roman peace. That's the promise. We'll protect you. That's the path and the promise. But here's the payment in their gospel. You pay taxes not to the local group. You pay taxes to Caesar. You pay taxes to Rome. You do that you obey us, you pay us, we'll protect you. That's the good news of that day. That's the gospel that Jewish people were living under when Jesus begins his work. Now, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they know about this type of gospel. But Jesus, he was a whole new movie. He was a whole new gospel, new path, new promise, and a different kind of price. Here was Jesus' gospel, the path, come follow me, imitate me, learn from me. From Matthew's gospel, come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for all of this. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the path, the promise, I will give you rest. I will also give you life and give it to you abundantly. The old gospel, it's like a thief. It comes to steal and kill and destroy. It's not that way anymore. I've come to give you life. The price, the price. There's always a cost to follow Jesus. Anything worthwhile, there's a price, there's a cost. And I don't want to diminish that, what it means to follow Jesus. But here's where the good news of this gospel, of Jesus, hits home. The price, Jesus ultimately pays the price on the cost for us. It's not what we have to do anymore. This is God's grace by Jesus' death on the cross. By his blood, he redeems us. By his resurrection on Easter morning, he tells us, well, I'll have new life. All you have to do is trust me. Old gospel, we paid the price, and if we didn't, we would be thrown in jail or hung on a cross. New gospel, the gospel of Jesus, Jesus pays the price. Jesus wants us to live, so he gives up his life for us by going to the cross gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, come follow me, come to me, and I'll give you rest, I'll give you peace, I will give you life, I got you covered. Isaiah 43, 1, fear not, fear not, do not be afraid. I've redeemed you, I've rescued you, I've called you by name, and you are mine. That's the gospel of Jesus, that's the good news, the story of God for all of us. But we struggle with trusting that, for submitting to that, for surrender, surrendering to that. I struggle with that. And maybe it's just too simple. We all know simple doesn't mean easy. We struggle, I struggle with living fully into or under the gospel. And maybe that's just part of being human. Because oftentimes we end up living under a false gospel, one that has a path and a promise and a price, but it doesn't lead to Jesus. I just want to throw out, and I... I I used some of this against, uh, with our staff this week. I want to throw out five false gospels that we may fall under and may live under. And there's, probably, there's probably more, but see if you might be living under one or more of these false gospels. False gospel number one, having to be in control. Um, you want to be in control, and you, you hate not being in control. Engineers, and I'm a recovering engineer, we might fall in this category. Um, nine times nine needs to equal 81 every time. 
You love when things are black and white, no gray in your lives allowed. You want to you wanna be in control so you can steer, literally and physically. Some of us control freaks, you always want to drive the car um, um, because you believe every other driver is incompetent. I mean, that's how I feel. And, and, and here's a biggie, you want to fix people. You control folks. And here's how you do it. You do this, you do this, psh, fixed. Anybody control people here? Um, hi, my name's Joe. I have control issues. <laughs> False gospel number one, um, needing to be in control. For every one of these gospels, there, there's a path. There's a promise, and there's a price, a price we pay. For control folks, here's the path. Um, my way. It's my way or the highway kind of thing. But here's the promise, albeit false. Do it my way because it's the right way. And here's the price. Your heart and your soul and your relationships with the people in your life, with your relationships with God. False gospel number one, control. False gospel number two, perfectionism. Perfectionists want to get it perfect every time. Even though they've never gotten it perfect before, they believe the next time they'll get it perfect. Any perfectionists in the rooms? Come on. Okay, thank you. Um, you guys are freaks of nature. I'll just say that right out. Um, you guys always want it to be perfect, and musicians are often this way. You may play a song or sing a song perfectly. The world hears this beautiful piece of music. They compliment you. You say, nope, nope, could have done it better. Perfectionists, it's never good enough. Not for you, and that demand for perfection can spread to those around you. Life can be a struggle, and it often goes downhill pretty quickly from there as you require folks around you to be perfectionists. False gospel number two, perfectionists. False gospel number three, always needing to know or have the answer. The right answer. You're the answer, answer person. You always have an opinion about everything, and you believe your answer. Your opinion is always right. There might be a few folks like that in this room this morning or in your life. Um, false gospel number three, always having to have the answer or the right answer. False gospel number four, always needing to be needed. Somebody gets sick, I'm baking them lasagna or banana bread or something. They need that. I'm sure that will make them better. Somebody, anybody, somebody, anybody is hurting. Man, we're on it. We're looking for the next person that might need us. Flat tire, I can fix that. Can't do calculus, I'll learn it, then I'll teach you. Um, <laughs> If you've ever said those things or thought those things, you might fall under this false gospel um, of always needing to be needed. The need to be needed is oftentimes more about us than the person that actually may have the need. False gospel number four, always needing to be needed. False gospel number five, last one, approval. Always wanting to be liked. If you're a people pleaser, if, you're never, if you never want to let people down, this might be your false gospel. I live under this stupid gospel. I am a golden retriever at heart. We talked about that at staff. I just want you to pat me on the head <laughs> and, and tell me I'm doing a good job and I'll go fetch the ball forever. Um, and, but as a pastor, as a leader, I have to really fight hard against this one because it's no way to lead without running myself into the ground or leading to pure exhaustion, to burnout. And I've been there before. Just a, a quick, sick experiment. You want to see me struggle with this false gospel real time? Just come up to me after church today and say this. You know, Joe, that might have been the worst sermon I have ever heard. <laughs> it was boring. You missed the mark. Sorry, kid. Maybe try again next week. And I'll get anxious right there in front of you and maybe pay you money to like me. Um, <laughs> oh, if, if, if you're someone... This is, again, false gospel approval. If you're someone who gets 10 compliments and one slightly negative comment, you'll dwell on that one negative till the cows come home. This false gospel of approval might be yours. All of these false gospels, all false truths. Some steps to maybe combat these false gospels. For us control um, people, it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about God. And we need to let go and trust God. God, you got this. I don't. And I love this, how, how AA's people summarize this, the 12-step program. Um, I can't. God can. I think I'll let him today. I can't. God can. I think I'll let him today. For you perfectionist people, the only one who is truly perfect, we know, Jesus. 
Nobody this side of heaven is perfect. Stop trying to be. For answer people, there is truly a freedom to be able to say, I don't know. Stop trying to be, excuse me, the answer guy. Stop trying to be God. And I remember as a hospital chaplain back in my 25 years ago when I was in seminary, man, did I struggle with this. People asking me in the hospital in a, in a horrific setting, why did this happen? How did, this, how did God allow this horrible thing to happen to my son or to my wife? And me thinking I had to have an answer, that I had to answer for God, I had to defend, defend God. I blew it every time. When I finally started saying, I don't have a clue, I don't know why this happened, I could feel God's presence come in the room. And oftentimes when the folks would cry out those questions, they were not looking for an answer. It was just they were speaking out of their pain. You don't have to know the answers. God says, I got you. Needing to be needed people, again, it's more about our need than the folks we're trying to help. God says, trust me. I got you. I'm the only one you'll, you really need. Let me fill you and satisfy you. And thus approval, folks, for us, for all of us golden retriever types, God's word to Jesus before he starts his public ministry, God's words to us. You are my daughter. You are my son. I love you. I love you. With you, I am well pleased. Be blessed by those words. Be encouraged by those words. Be affirmed by those words. Jesus speaking to all of us. You are my son. You are my daughter. I love you. With you, I am well pleased. Know that. Trust that. But we all have gospel. We all have a gospel floating around in our heads and in our hearts. What gospel are you and I trying to live under? Is it the gospel of Jesus? Or is it some other gospel? And I want to move us from the false gospels that we may be living under back to this gospel story, this gospel of Jesus. I want to bring us back to God's gospel story to this day, early in the life of the first disciples, these first students of Jesus. What was Jesus trying to teach them as they begin their journey with Jesus, as they watch him? as they learn from him, as they follow him. From the demon-possessed man, he had these two questions. What do you want with us, Jesus? Have you come to destroy us? Have you come to make us miserable? And I want to say underneath the excitement of those early days, when, they, when, when Peter and, and Andrew and James and John, when they start following Jesus, there's, there's a certain excitement, there's adrenaline flowing. But what gospel were they learning? And were these the two questions, peel back the layers, were these the, the same two questions that they had? The questions the early disciples had. What do you want with us? And have you come to destroy us or ruin our lives? Jesus heals the demon-possessed guy at church, and then seemingly a few minutes later, he heals Simon's mother-in-law at home. Healing happens in church, it happens in the home, and now, this last part of this story, now healing is going to happen at the back door of Simon and Andrew's house. Words out, this kind of news, you better watch out, this can spread like wildfire, especially if Jesus is in the middle of it. The text says, the people brought to Jesus all the sick, all the demon-possessed, and the whole town, everybody, everybody gathered at the, at the door, at the back door to watch to witness, to see for themselves, to learn who and what this Jesus was all about. Jesus was loving out this love thing. Love lives here at church. Love lives here at the house. Love lives wherever I am, Jesus was saying. This was truly a new type of gospel for these folks. And the boys, the Fisher boys, Simon and Andrew, James and John, front row back porch seats to watch all of this. And Jesus loved every one of those folks at the back door that night. Jesus was saying this, if not directly, looking in their eyes. He spoke it without words. Come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, with authority, with Shemekah, from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. All authority, this is Jesus speaking to us right before he goes to heaven, but speaks to us all along the journey. All authority, all authority, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, go now and bring folks to me. At Simon and Andrew's back door that night, folks lined up outside the door to be healed, and they were. 
Good church happened outside Simon and Andrew's back door that night. Folks helping folks. People brought people to Jesus. People who cared brought folks they loved, folks they knew who were suffering. They brought them to Jesus that night, and Jesus healed them. Just a quick reminder, we don't have to be Jesus. We just have to invite them to Jesus. And Jesus' words in Matthew's gospel, again, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, go bring folks to me. It's not about us. It's about God, about what God can do in and through us. And that night when the sick and demon-possessed folks came to the back door, they were brought to the back door by folks who looked a lot like you and me. They were all looking for something, tired of false gospels, tired of living under false gospels, tired of being sick and tired, tired of trying to fix something that was way beyond what they could do, tired of running in circles and not getting anywhere. Jesus was showing all the folks that night, but especially his first disciples, Simon and Andrew, James and John, this is how you love folks. This is how you care for folks. This is how you model love, that love lives here and here and here and here. Jesus at the back door loving and healing these folks. No agenda, no, no schedule, no appointments needed, no questions asked. Jesus just loving them. Agape love, unconditional love. Jesus didn't care what political party they were a part of, didn't care whether they were in church or not that morning, didn't care if they were gay or straight or crooked as all get out. He didn't care who their parents were, didn't care how much money they had, didn't care if they were single or divorced or widowed. Jesus loved them. And he loved them all. He healed them. God, through Jesus, was on the loose. And when we do this church thing close to being right, we too are a place of healing. Not just, not just a place or a building, but a people in a place that's about healing. Always pointing to Jesus, a place where folks can start over. A place where we remember who we are and whose we are. A place where we encourage each other, and if need be, we carry them we carry each other all the way to the back door, and we ask Jesus to heal them. As best we can, church, let's try to be that kind of church, to live that way, to love that way. Jesus' words to all of us, to all of those folks that met at Simon and Andrew's back door, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, my ways are gentle and humble. I'm humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burdens are light. Let me pray us out. Um, Heavenly Father, as we come to